The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I'm going to introduce um, our external co lead from Dartmouth, uh, Professor Robert Fiesen, who is a professor of physics and astronomy. Um, has also spent time at the University of Colorado Boulder, also at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, um, as well as has been the acting director of MDM Observatory at Kitt Peak and has also been on the board of directors at the 10 meter SALT telescope in South Africa. But really is, um, I, I found the, the person who, uh, as a scientist, has been thinking about integrating science instruments on airships longer than, than anyone. So he's going to give us a little bit more of an idea of, of, of the timeliness of this study and um, what has led us to this point. So please uh, welcome Robert Friesen. Okay, Sarah, are you going to start this? All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, we're going to hopefully have over the next few days a nice discussion about how to use airships for science, both low altitude as well as high altitude. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in, uh, lately in airships, both in the public media, um, but also on the science side. If you, can do, if you can build airships like these and fly them at either low altitudes, very heavy payloads, uh, you can do some interesting work um, and then very high altitudes, uh, you can do um, a lot of astrophysics that would be very interesting. Um, as Sarah's pointed out, there are disadvantages and advantages for airships. Um, you can maneuver, of course, and you can possibly do station keeping. Uh, you offer possibly night and day operations. That would be really different from what the NASA balloons um, flown over the polar regions have done. They're basically just daytime observations. Um, and since you're not limited to just going around the poles, you can do wider latitude ranges, you can do mid-latitudes, um, equatorial regions, and there's real advantages to do it at mid-latitudes and, and, and equatorial regions. And then you have, if you can really do station keeping or semi-station keeping, you can do simple line of sight communications. Uh, the disadvantage is that <clears throat> for an airship uh, perspective, at altitudes above 90,000 feet or even maybe 85,000 feet, you just don't have enough air to push on. Uh, people have talked about uh, having airships at 120,000 feet where you can get UV and uh, X-ray emission. But there's very little air up there, and so you don't have a lot to push on. And so I think for airships, uh, you're gonna, we're going to have to keep our discussions lower than, than say, 90,000 feet, and that may even be a stretch. Station keeping just means sitting in... Sitting in just roughly one area. It doesn't have to be... Uh, for the military, uh, station keeping is very restrictive. It's uh, within a, staying above a point, maybe within a 10 or 50 kilometer radius. Um, uh, scientific reasons, you don't need that station keeping. Might, you might want to move to a particular locale to observe some occultation or some interesting astronomical observation, or you might want to survey the atmosphere at a range of latitudes, and so you want to be able to maneuver um, but so station keeping is a general term. It's it's been used a lot for airships, mostly on the military side, because they've spent a lot of money on airships uh, development. Um, but for a science mission, you don't have to necessarily, I think, keep station keeping in in line where you have to have a a, a very restrictive uh, radius of locale. Yes. Um, buoyancy is always an issue, <laughs> um, but no, uh, for, for the disadvantages, it's not the buoyancy issue, it's really just pushing the thin air uh, with propellers, um, unless you want to have uh, some sort of uh, uh, turbine-powered uh, vehicle. I mean, we've had turbine-powered vehicles up at these altitudes for 40, 50 years, uh, spy, uh, spy uh, aircraft. Uh, but for, for, air, for airships, it's really an issue of can you maintain your, your, your direction of motion rather than just moving along with the air. Uh, practical payloads for airships, because 
Once you have a lot of mass, you have a big envelope, and of course the bigger envelopes create more drag, and so you have to have more power, one more power. Especially at night, you need bigger batteries, and so it just keeps building on itself. So I think the, the practical standpoint is below these uh, 85 or 90,000 feet uh, levels. You can have payload masses far less than what the NASA balloons are. That's just, I think, just part of the physics here. And you may not be able to do station keeping at any, any given location all year round because the winds can be variable. Um, at 65,000 feet is the sweet spots between 60 and 65,000 feet. The winds are seasonally the lowest, but they can get up to uh, 30, 40, 50 uh, meters per second, double that's miles per hour. So it can get really bad. So you may not be able to do even station keeping very accurately. Why hold a workshop now? <laughs> why, why do we want to do it right now? Why, why hold it? Um, well, there's been a lot of work um, spent by various governments, especially the U.S. government, on, um, <clears throat> on airship development, and that has really started since the, the late 90s uh, and has continued on to, the, uh, to this day. Um, and so there's a lot of experience and lessons learned from all these Department of Defense airship involvements, as well as uh, Japan and, and um, U.K. has done some work. Uh, Korea has involved itself in airships years ago. Um, so we've learned a lot. There's a lot of community uh, knowledge and lessons learned. So this might be a good time to talk about airships because airships have not been, at least from the science side of things, really a viable uh, lighter-than-air platform. There's also been a community uh, realization that you can do good science with payloads that don't weigh one to two or three tons. Um, we don't have to lift uh, Ford Explorers up at uh, 100,000 feet. So, uh, and so this is the large ship uh, that Lockheed built. Um, the Keck Institute for Space Science uh, has done several KISS workshops, and this was just last year, not even uh, a year ago, Small Satellites of Revolution in Space Science. So this is an opportunity to use the ideas of small satellites, nanosatellites, cube satellites. People didn't realize you could build a... a uh, a scientifically productive payload that was in a cube or two or three cubes size. So I think we can, we can low, again, lowering the mass rather than thinking of the NASA balloons. If you need to launch uh, a two-ton vehicle, airships may not be the way to do it, unless you're talking about, as Sarah points out, very low altitudes, typically below 20,000 feet. And then for propulsion, there's been a lot of experience and, and, and uh, success on high-altitude solar-powered propeller, which is um, uh, pro propeller vehicles, which is what uh, an airship really is, is solar-powered. And there's with the Pathfinder with solar-powered aerovironment. Someone's here from aerovironment. They flew several years ago at 76,000 feet. Helios was a, was a marketing uh, thing to go up to 100,000 feet. It didn't quite make it up to 100,000 feet. It was like 96 or 98,000. Solar power during the day, they launch it at, at, at sunrise and then fly it up and then have to land it just before sunset. And Zephyr, which uh, lasted um, uh, 336 hours at uh, 65,000 feet with a five pound payload. We know now how to do propulsion, solar power propulsion. And so if we combine that with um, airship experience, and then realize that we don't have to, or we may not want to consider, for at least for high altitude, uh, big one-ton payloads. I think we can be fairly successful. Um, just to run down some numbers, we've spent a lot of money. The U.S. government by itself has spent a enormous amount of money. These are the various airship manufacturers with the prime contracts, and these are the various altitudes. Notice the altitudes are either at 65 or above or below 20,000 feet. Um, these two at the bottom here, you see a lot, these are all individual one-offs, uh, except for High Sentinel. Uh, these, these are aerostats, uh, tethered uh, airships, essentially. Uh, they, they, they actually are not really airships. They don't have propellers. They're just tethered. Well, we've built a lot of them. We've spent billions of dollars on those. But these, there's a lot of money here, and there's a lot of experience. And I, and I would like to think we can, we can use this, this money spent to um, develop airships for science, which are really quite different requirements than for military applications. Military applications is all about ISR, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. That phrase, that, that acronym is used all, all the time in military. Well, we just want reconnaissance, basically. Um, 
And there's a problem uh, that has been around for many years. This is uh, Mike Smith's uh, Aerostar slide I stole from. You have little tiny balloons uh, below 12 pounds uh, permitted by the FAA. People launch them all the time. Uh, high schools <laughs> do this all the time. And then the big payloads, which weigh tons. So this is 12 pounds and tons. There's almost nothing in between. And airships for science may be able to fit into that that wedge, a big open space. It's not completely empty, but it's, it's fairly empty. Um, um, Elliot Young, who was in the audience, and I uh, held a, a, a workshop in Boulder about three years ago, and it was essentially bridging, trying to bridge the gap to space, lightweight science payloads for high altitude duration. We were just talking about high altitude, not atmospheric low al altitudes or big <coughs> payloads on 15 or 20,000 foot altitude things. And the idea was to, to talk about that. Um, one of the uh, <coughs> first airships, in a little history, um, uh, was launched in the 60s. Uh, and the concept of a buoyant stratospheric vehicle, which can sit over a geographical location that you are desired, you want to sit over, has been essentially the holy grail for the lighter-than-air community for decades. And this is it. This is the two people stand here. This is a Mylar, transparent Mylar balloon. Raven Industries built it in the uh, 60s. Uh, they took, took two flights, um, 67,000 feet for two hours, and then with a five-pound payload. Pathetic. But it's a CubeSat, essentially, today. We've, we couldn't do uh, science with a five-pound payload until fairly recently, any sort of science, really. Um, and then I think they had another flight that lasted seven hours. Since that time, we haven't had a lot of success launching other airships. And it's because the drivers for airships has been low altitude, big cargo, or high altitude ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, communications with other satellites, communications with troops on the ground, the warfighter thing, the whole bit. Um, for, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, observations for airships, I know a good fraction of the people in the room are interested in uh, astronomical uses for airships. And for airships, you don't have to get up to 120,000 feet with, like the NASA balloons. Uh, you can do um, reasonable science at even lower altitudes. And just how high up do you have to go to get space-like conditions? Well, it's a good question. How high do you have to go? Um, this is a photograph. Let's go back. That's a photograph out the window of a, of a U-2, essentially, at 70,000 feet. So you're pretty high up. And... Um, at 65,000 feet, you're above essentially 95% of the atmosphere, and the air overhead is dry and clear. At 85,000 feet, you're above all essentially 98% of the atmosphere. Now, you're not above the ozone layer. That starts at uh, about these altitudes and goes to about, a, um, about 30 kilometers up, over 100,000 feet. Uh, so you can't do UV and X-ray uh, work. But you would like to have, and this has been, as I said, the desire for... for uh, for a lot of scientists, myself included, to, to have a perch uh, and fairly stable, not flying with the winds all the time, not being at the whim of the winds, uh, to be able to stay up and look down, look up as well as down. You can do uh, wonderful reconnaissance of the Earth. You can do atmospheric studies of the air uh, quality and um, and chemical uh, <coughs> uh, chemical composition. At these altitudes, there is not a lot of work done because the balloons that have been flown are, are typically uh, last just a few days for atmospheric studies, have a situation up there to see just, in fact, what the winds are. I've talked to atmospheric scientists. I said, well, how light a payload can you do real science from a high-altitude balloon? And the person said, zero grams. He just wants to know uh, the location. If you blow, if you move with the wind, he wants to know what the wind speeds are at these 65 to 100,000 feet altitudes. So. Do you know how dark <laughs> it's not dark enough to do optical work. Uh, your orders of magnitude too bright, even though it looks black. Uh, pilots at high altitudes always refer to an extremely black sky, but it's not, not good enough to do. You could, could do near-infrared, meaning at one or two microns. You can start to do bright targets. But, um, <clears throat> so um, uh, it, it's, it's very alluring, at least from an astronomical standpoint, and, and also from uh, looking down at the Earth. Uh, remember the... Uh, the U-2 itself has a, has a camera that can resolve a couple inches on the ground. So uh, you can do great reconnaissance on, on the ground. You can do uh, 
multispectral studies of uh, terrestrial features. You can do atmospheric chemistry. Uh, looking up, of course, if you only had an amateur-sized telescope at 20 at the high altitude, so you had a 20-inch telescope, half a meter, you could produce 0.25 arc second images. Well, that would make you the highest resolution uh, I uh, instrument uh, outside of the Hubble Space Telescope, basically. Every now you can do it every night, and you would have it uh, on, on call every single night because you're above the weather. Um, just one last little note. Um, when we talk about, when we go into the discussions, about uh, airships, uh, a lesson uh, learned uh, for high altitude vehicles of all sorts is cost. Um, this is uh, a U-2 aircraft, uh, the newer version of the U-2s, newer meaning in the late 80s and the 1980s. Um, the, the problem of cost is, is a major issue and it's going to play a big role in whether you can get funding from any agency. Um, <clears throat> the U-2, which was developed, first flew in 1955, is still flying today. Now, it has survived um, the advent of the SR-71, which a lot of people consider the finest aircraft ever built. It could fly at 80,000 feet for several hours. It could do, re uh, with refueling, go around the world. That's amazing. They retired that in 93, and then they brought it back, but then they retired again in 98. Why? Too expensive. It costs a few hundred million dollars to run each year, just a few aircraft. The Global Hawk, which has been running for 15 years, the Air Force has now decided they're not going to buy any more Global Hawks. In fact, they're going to retire them. For what? What's their ISR? You too. Cheaper. It's simple. Sorry, keep going. Keep going. It's automatic. Sorry. It's, uh, it's just vastly cheaper to run. And Global Hawks depending on how much you, uh, who you believe in, who you ask, uh, they run 20, $35 million to $160 million each to fly the $37,000 an hour, all that stuff. They're getting rid of them. They're going back to U-2. The U-2 is going to fly to 2015, and there was this announcement from the airports, they're going to fly to 2023. This is insanity. Why? Cost. So cost can, can win in the end. This little aircraft that was developed in the 50s is still flying today, and it is doing the work that, in this case, the military wants to do. So um, that brings up uh, a meeting that uh, Elliot Young also held uh, back in Boulder in 2007, uh, low-cost access to space. And he named this very well, in my opinion, low-cost access to near space. <laughs> I think that is an important facet. So be, I'll be very interested uh, to... Here are the discussions over the next three days, how we go about using um, airships, various airships, low-altitude, high-altitude airships for science. Thanks.